Hi everyone, it's Paul Tilly and this is LW1230 and we're talking about torts. In this particular section we're looking at the application of torts with some legal cases and applying some of the concepts. So stay tuned. I'm going to do a review of what we looked at. I've added in some cases to illustrate some of the points that we talked about. Here are the six that are focused on in our course. Assault and battery, false imprisonment, trespass, nuisance, defamation, and negligence. So assault deals with uh, a threat that you as a victim perceive. You perceive that I'm going to hurt you. That's all it takes. You have to perceive it. Now, I say that's all it takes, but it's in your mind that I'm going to hurt you. So you, in order for an assault to occur, it has to be in your mind that I'm going to hurt you, but it also it has to have the ability for me to hurt you. If you think I'm going to punch you and you say to the judge, well, you know, he said he was going to punch me. I believed he was going to punch me, but I'm on the other end of this computer. There's no physical way for me to punch you here now. So no matter what I say or what you think, I can't do it. So there's really no assault that takes place. So to be an assault, there must be a physically possible to carry it out. There's no need for an assault to be harmful. It must only be I want it. Now, when I use the word harmful, i got to be careful here because I don't like that word harmful. Harmful meaning physically harmful. It could be mentally harmful, okay? And, and mentally harmful means it's unwanted. Now, that normally applies to uh, a sexual assault, okay? I don't physically have to mean anything by it. I made a stupid remark. It was not physically harmful to you. However, you perceived it as harmful in your mind. Hence, it is strictly an assault. Now, assaults do not require physical contact. Battery is what happens when there is physical contact. Battery is someone actually punching. Now, the thing is with battery is battery starts crossing the line into a criminal act. I'm not allowed to go around hitting and punching people out. That's against the law. You can't do that. So you could sue me if I were to physically hit you. You could sue me for assault and battery. But also the court system could take me to, co take me to court in criminal law to say that I actually punched someone and I could be put in jail for that. <clears throat> One of the things that you need to think of for this in terms of assessing these types of um, these types of torts is what are some of the potential defenses that I could use if you are going to sue me for assault and battery? What are some of the things that I could come back and say, oh no, well, that's not really the case because? Well, the first because is consent. If you and I have consented, to whatever we're doing, whatever we're doing. And if we are in a, you know, I punch you and we're in a boxing ring, or if I check you and we're in a hockey game and checking is allowed in that hockey game and you're fully aware and you check people too, that is what is considered as consent. Sometimes it's what's called implied consent, meaning we never actually sat down and and talked about this, but the rules of the game are that you're allowed to hit people in boxing and then you're allowed to hurt, hit people or, you know, physical, make physical contact with people, we'll say, in hockey. That's the rules of the game. I don't need, and you don't need to sit down with me and say, well, okay, we're going to do this tonight and we're going to hit one another. No, the rules of the game say that we're allowed to do that. So there's what's called implied consent. So if the circumstances were such that you're claiming assault and battery against me, I'm going to use the, the excuse or the, the defense to say, look, we consented to this. We're playing a hockey game. The rules of the hockey game allow for checking. I checked. And the check was in the reasonable realm of the game of hockey. Once it goes beyond the reasonable realm of the game of hockey, nobody consented, for example, to having their throat cut. Nobody consented to having their their skull fractured. Nobody consented to having a stick cracked across their back. Nobody consented to that. 
if the rules of the game need to be considered in light of what is normally acceptable in under implied consent. Okay. The other major defense that we could use for assault and battery is self-defense. And this is where you are trying to protect yourself from an assault and battery. You feel that you are in danger and you feel that unless you don't, unless you protect yourself, you will be hurt seriously or killed. In that case, you're allowed to use force to, to warn off that attack. But the force has to be reasonable. It has to be measured. If I tread on your toe, you can't take out a gun and shoot me for it. I, if I, even if I did it purposely, I'm treading on your toe. I'm not going to hurt you to a great extent. You just shot me. So, you know, the reasonable force is, is what courts often decide. And defining what reasonable force is, is often a, a job of the courts because that is not a really a defined term, but it has to be under the rational person consideration and which is what's used in this, would a rational person see that as reasonable? If not, then that would be argued otherwise. I've got a, a few case summaries put in here that kind of illustrate some of the issues of assault and battery, particularly as it applies to things that happen normally in the course of work, okay? I don't know if they're normal, but it, they have happened, okay? I won't use the word normal. Okay, this is the Swanson versus, versus Malloy, and this is the spraying of Pam. Now, this is Pam, the stuff that you put on your pots and pans, uh, the no-stick uh, spray, cooking oil. During a labor dispute at Safeway in Regina, three striking workers on two occasions sprayed cooking oil, Pam, on Monica Swanson, who was working as a security guard. As a result, she suffered laryngitis, headaches, nausea, was unable to go back to work for one year. They were charged criminally, but at a preliminary hearing, it was decided that there wasn't enough evidence to proceed criminally. Okay, so again, the standard is much higher in criminal law than it is in civil law. So Mrs. Swanson decided to sue in civil action, so she sued him in tort. At the trial, the striking workers were found liable and were assessed damages in the amount of $33,869 for lost income, trauma, and punitive damages. This illustrates the difference between criminal and civil action. The criminal action required a higher standard of proof and was dismissed, but the civil action was decided on the balance of probabilities and that the standard was indeed met. The balance of probabilities that she suffered her injuries because of being sprayed with Pam. That's what we mean by that. So labor disputes often involve high emotions on both sides. And, uh, but when conduct steps over the line and, tort, uh, and a tort or crime is committed, the perpetrator is liable for actions. All concerned should take great care to avoid this kind of physical confrontation. So this is a, this is a very interesting one that happens quite a bit in labor, okay? We got a second case here too of uh, a blood transfusion, and, and this is something that we hear tell of. So Mrs. Mallette was seriously injured in a car accident, and she was in hospital. And Dr. Schulman determined that she had to have a blood transfusion in order to save her life. The nurse, however, discovered a card in the patient's purse indicating that she was Jehovah's Witnesses, and by definition, Jehovah's Witnesses do not accept blood transfusions. The card gave an instruction that under no circumstances could blood or blood products be administered to Mrs. Martle. Dr. Schulman ignored the card and proceeded to administer the transfusion. When the family arrived and repeated the instruction, Dr. Schulman still overruled him and continued with the blood transfusion. There were no question that the blood transfusion was needed in order to preserve her life. Upon her recovery, though, Mrs. Mallett sued Dr. Schulman for trespass of her person, which is battery. The, the judgment held that Mrs. Mallette had withheld her consent to the treatment and that the administration of the blood transfusion against her wishes amounted to battery by the doctor and was awarded $20,000 damages. The decision was held in appeal. Despite the doctor clearly had good intentions, he had clear good intention, the person has a right to decide what will happen to his or her own body and this doctor's conduct violated that right. Every once in a while, 
You do hear Cal of a case in court in Canada that involves this very same thing. Now, if we look at precedent, so precedent says that they have the right to refuse. The, the problem with the precedent is the cases that we see before the courts now is children of these people, okay? So if someone, for some reason whatsoever, does not, whether they're Jehovah's or anything else, they don't want a drug transfusion, if they don't believe in blood transfusion yet their child is dying and their child needs a blood transfusion, such as the case in cancer, uh, the court can overrule the parents and and basically make the child a ward of the uh, award of the state and administer the transfusion. But for individuals who are of age, if you clearly say that you don't want this, you don't have to have it. Just yesterday, as a matter of fact, in the news, uh, again, sort of building on this case, uh, Nova Scotia, Scotia changed their legislation yesterday to reflect the fact that if you're killed in a car accident, you can have your body parts or organs uh, taken from you to donate to keep people alive. Normally in Newfoundland, for example, we have a, a donor card that you need to sign or it needs to be on record that you are a, a donor, and I encourage you to do that. But in Nova Scotia, They've got it flipped. The legislation has flipped as of yesterday that says if you say that you don't want it, you can do that, but you it's assumed that you allow it. That will end up in court. I assure you that will end up in court because of very similar circumstances to this. We also talked about false imprisonment, and false imprisonment is, and the word imprisonment throws us off. Basically, you're being held against your will. OK, so and, and it's not only physically held, but you perceive that you are being held. So false imprisonment is an unlawful restraint of a person. If they feel they're prevented from leaving, this includes physical restraint as well as when the victim thinks she has no option to leave. So false imprisonment occurs if there's an arrest by a private citizen where no crime has taken place. So there's a couple of caveats that you need to consider, that you need to be aware of here. False imprisonment can only happen from a tort point of view if it was done by a private citizen. So if you're a police officer, you can arrest someone. If you're not a police officer, you can't. And the question then becomes, well, I know that you can have a personal uh, 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 citizen arrest, so what are you saying? Well, the question then becomes, was a crime committed? If you know that a crime has been committed. If you are 100% certain that that is the person, you cut them right handed basically, you can hold them. Yes, you can. But if you're not sure, you can't. So the critical issue is, were you sure? Were you sure? This is a real problem in stores and stores need to be so, so careful. Here's an example of a case, Snow versus Bretton's. So Mrs. Snow purchased an item in the defendant's store and upon leaving set off the security alarm. Happens all the time at Walmart, doesn't it? Buy something electronic. I bet you darn you'll set off the alarm. I do. A sales clerk took her by the arm and escorted her to the back of the store where her bag was searched. It was determined that the tag inadvertently was left on the item which Mrs. Mrs. Snow had properly purchased and had gift wrapped. And that had set off the alarm. And upon leaving, her embarrassment was made worse when she met a co-worker from her own place of employment. She sued the store for false imprisonment. And the court held that when she returned with the store clerk to the store, it was reasonable for her to think that she had no choice and that so imprisonment had taken place. <clears throat> it was false because she actually didn't do anything wrong. So there was no offense that occurred. Rather, the employee in the store had...
We also talked about trespass. Trespass involves coming onto another's property without permission and, um, you know, mistake as to the property line is no defense. So if you weren't sure. Now, we see that happen quite a bit in uh, from a town council point of view. Uh, people build a shed and they end up across someone else's property line. They say, oh, I didn't know. Uh, that's no excuse. They still need to make sure that they're, they need, if the onus is on them to know where their property line is. So if permission were to be revoked, the person must be given the opportunity to leave. So if you come onto my property and say, I want you off my property, uh, you know, I have to give you an opportunity to leave. I can't punch you in the nose. This idea of throwing someone out of a bar, for example, like we saw on on, uh, on movies, you, you can't do that because what is defined as reasonable and you cannot go beyond reasonable force. Bouncers at bars on George Street need to be super aware of this law. What is reasonable? How much force do you use? And if someone perceives it as being unreasonable, they have an actionable case. So the duties of the trespasser is minimal. Well, yeah, to some extent, you know, if someone trespasses on my property, I can't put a booby trap there and and have them speared, for example, if they cross my property or electrocuted or shot, you know, an automatic, some sort of a automatic item. Because again, I will know and I should know that if people cross the line, they will be hurt. And it's even greater if it's a child. So the the message here is if you're putting up a fence for example a chain link fence you have to make sure it's well marked because the duty to the trespassers did not try not to hurt them so there's only one defense in trespass and that the intruder had no control of where he or she was now here's a very interesting and often cited case called epstein versus cressy development okay and this kind of illustrates the issue of trespass below ground. I call it below ground. So Cressy Development Corporation excavated a lot next to a property owned by Mr. Epstein and asked permission to drive supports under Epstein's property. So what we're doing is we're driving steel pipes or steel pillars under his property in order to keep the ground from falling into the new property. So after unsuccessfully trying other methods to shore up the excavation, Cressy drove the supports under the property anyway. Okay, so first they ask, Epsi said, uh, Epsi said, no, you can't put the pipes under my property. They couldn't keep the, the walls from falling in, so they drove the pipes under his property anyway, think, nah, well, the heck with it, he's not going to use it. So when Epstein found out, he sued for trespass. And Cressy claimed that trespass was not done out of uh, what was done out of necessity, and that there was no in interference on Epstein's use of the property. Look, we drove the. Their argument is we drove the pipes underground. It didn't affect you. It had no impact on your property. We had to do it. Da da. So the court held that the trespass had indeed taken place. The damage was caused since future development was now restricted. Mr. Cressy, for example, couldn't sell the lot and it couldn't be excavated to put a building on because these pipes were there. Um, and Cressy Development Corporation had been warned by their own engineer that it would amount to a trespass. Even so, they went ahead and with, with real no concern for Epstein's rights. So punitive damages were justified in this situation. So punitive damages means that he got damages over and above the cost. Like he got a he got a, a settlement for this. In this case, significant damages were awarded, but the award um, of the injunction to remove the supports would have been much worse since Cressy had completed the construction of the building. So the court didn't order that the building be, the new building be torn down and the report, uh, supports taken out. Great care should be taken to avoid these situations, and one should never assume that just because an incursion on another activity is nece necessary to facilitate your business affairs, uh, you, can't, you can't argue that. So your business problems are not the problems of a neighbor. So, uh, so, you have a wanna, so how far down does our property go then? I don't know well, about uh, that. How far underground it goes? Yeah, and, and that question actually has come up in a court of law because in, in both directions. How far down and how far up, right? 
So what do we define as the, uh, this is a big thing with drones, for example. You, you fly over a drone. Uh, am I trespassing? All right? So uh, there have been uh, there have been some court cases on this, and everything is a little bit different. Um, uh, in the case of underground, you could argue that you own the mineral rights under your property. The exact definition of how far down, I don't think there is any hard standard on that. But the fact the court will look at is, did it interfere with your use or potential use of the property? So if it's a reasonable use, like uh, 20 feet down, as in the case of the Cressy, uh, they would argue, yeah. Now if it's 10,000 feet down, probably not. The sky questions come up more often. Uh, there have been several cases with regards to overflights by airplanes and these sorts of things. What is it? And uh, again, uh, depending on the situation, you do have a certain degree of rights over your property with regards to aerial. Um, the legislation, for example, and a lot of this is taken care of in legislation. Transport Canada lays out regulations for the operation of aircraft, including drones, over personal property. And they must be a certain height. So a drone has to be 75 meters. Uh, the an airplane, I think it's 2,000. It, it's normally in feet. Height is usually recorded in feet. Uh, I think it's 2,000 feet. But I, I well, I hope it's higher than 75 meters. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's. Uh, I think 75 meters might work out to 200 feet. Uh, you know, that's that's where it is. So the uh, the fact of the matter is, though, there are rules and regulations with regards to it. And the question is. Did you break those rules and regulations? And then, then that would be an issue that Transport Canada will deal with with regards to above. But it is very interesting. And, and the question is, you had to be mindful and get a legal opinion if you're going digging underground of what, what constitutes your, your ability and how far can you go. The other issue that we looked at was nuisance, and I'll finish up on this one. And so a private nuisance occurs when uh, when you use your property in such a way that you interfere with someone else, okay? So we talked about that, and it uh, depends on what the appropriate use of the property is. Residential, you wouldn't expect too much noise. Industrial, you would expect some degree of noise. So it depends on the property and uh, depends on the situation. I, oh, I don't have a one uh, for that in terms of... Uh, in terms of nuisance but the fact is is that there have been many court cases where one's enjoyment reasonable use of enjoyment of their property has been affected by someone and in the case of reasonable use and enjoyment there have been many law cases and the general consensus is that you have to be respectful of your neighbor so in the case of tim hortons right if you're backing on tim hortons they have to put up a privacy fence and these sorts of things so it will be the expense of the the uh, store as opposed to, and a lot of that is done in municipal bylaws in order to cover that off. And we talked about defamation and defamation really is in writing or in words. And we have lots of cases uh, where newspapers, for example, have been brought to charge or, or media have been brought to charge because they defamed someone. The real defense that you have is you spoke the truth. If you spoke the truth, there is no problem there. There is no law being broken. You're just relaying along the facts. However, you have to be careful to ensure that you keep it to the facts. So that's uh, that's a quick overview. And I've, I've put all of these in this little summary here.